Oh, good grief. Here we are. Here we are. I got to move like a ton of stuff. My monitor is just all over the place. So you're going to have to bear with me a minute while I get my ducks in a row. I literally just came out of one meeting and now I'm here. So you got to bear with me a second while I get all my stuff in order. Uh, tonight's going to be a really good one. Just so you know, tonight's going to be really, really something. Hang on. I'll be right back. All right. All right. We are we are going to rock and roll tonight. Tonight's plan is a little ambitious. This is something, uh, by the way, also, if you're watching this and you are uh, about to ask me, hey, what happened to that thing you were going to talk about romance novels, uh, romance like intimacy dynamics and sex scenes and stuff? I know. I know. I'll get there. Um, it, it'll get done. Just not right this second. Now we're going to talk about Andor. Uh, one thing, one piece of housekeeping before we really get going, I still have to go get a, another bottle of water cause I only have two here on the table. Um, one thing to bear in mind tomorrow, Tuesday, the 21st, in addition to the writer's chat, which will be here at our, our regular ish time of 1 PM Eastern. Uh, if you're a member of the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash John helps you write better you are going to get just deluged in Oppenheimer material. Uh, there will be one three hour plus stream, uh, not stream three hour plus recording for, you know, as per usual for every available for every tier. However, if you're a member of the $5 and up tiers, uh, maybe the $10 and up tier. well, no, let's say five and up. I don't know. You're going to get a bonus one. Another whole complete separate recording that's even more detailed because I have a lot to say and I'm looking forward to it and I'm looking forward to tonight as well. So um, before I really get going, I'm going to go grab more water and then we're going to rock and roll with this. So here we go. I'll be back in a second. Stay right there. Don't go anywhere. So many things. Oh, man. Oh, man. All right. Well, got all our ducks in a row. We good to go? We ready to do this? I think I'm ready to do this. Let me just clear some more space and declutter a little bit. Get this moved down. Get this moved over. I know the timer ticked down. I know, I know, I know. That's what I get for being on the fly and literally working right up until the minute the stream started, but it's okay. Cause I got to help somebody do something awesome. And that made me good. All right. Shall we get going? We ready for this? Hello there. Gosh, Bruce. Yes. I'll get these darn verbs if they kill me. And now we'll see how good you are. Work complete. Oh man, this one's going to be a good one. So let me tell you first how this started, how this came about. A couple weeks ago, there was a question in chat about really strong pieces of writing. And I mentioned very, very, very casually that Andor is amazing. And it, it kind of flew under the radar. Uh, it's not a big secret that people really like Andor or they really hate it. It's very polarizing. Some people have a weird, we'll talk about it, but some people have a weird expectation as to how Star Wars is supposed to be. And other people have a weird expectation about how writing a certain thing is supposed to be. And, and, or, and, or does both of those things, but it doesn't do both of those things in the way people expect. So it becomes this substantial issue, but I stand by my point 
that if you want to learn how to write better, we can take a look at different pieces of media, whether it's films or television shows or the Muppet show, and we can find tools we can use to apply for our own stuff, even though we're not writing sci-fi, even though we're not writing a Star Wars ripoff, even though we're not writing a political thriller or a spy story, we can find things in them to help us with our own stuff. And Andor is chock full, chock full of stuff you can pay attention to. Now, I know I get a lot of flack for this. And I often say this, and then people are like, but you never do. I often say something like, we're going to get technical. And then somebody says, you didn't get technical enough. Okay, hold up. There's some technical stuff here. It's not jargon heavy. I've actually stripped a lot of the jargon out because, well, most of the teachers who would grade me on that jargon are dead. So I'm not trying to make them happy. But instead... I've taken the jargon out to give you better formula, to give you better structure and tell you some better stuff. I'd also like you to know I'm wearing my work bathrobe because this is in fact work. So we're going to learn about Andor and we're going to talk about what it's like to write a thing like Andor. Not so much the Star Wars-iness of it, though we'll talk about that, but there are about five different sections here, five different big picture stuff that you can take forward for writing your romance novels, your fantasy stories, your detective stories, your cozy mysteries, uh, really anything fiction, you can find something here. You just got to be willing to bend a little bit and every once in a while kick an expectation away or be willing to drop some kind of assumption you have. Because at its heart, all writing, no matter the genre, No matter the licensed material, no matter the merchandising rights, no matter the color palette, no matter anything, all writing is universal expression of one person telling something to somebody else. That's what we're going for. That's what we have. And I'm going to do it through one of my favorite things in the whole fucking world, Star Wars. So, we ready? Let's go. Here's our premise. Here's our start point. Andor is the greatest piece of Star Wars media produced to date. Period. I will not be entertaining debate down in the comments. I'm not willing to argue this with you. This is the best thing. It is better than the later parts of the Skywalker saga. It is better than some of the cheeseball cartoons. It takes ideas presented way back in the original trilogy and it carries them forward. And it actually does quite a bit of heavy lifting politically, socially, structurally for the whole story and at most of the time you never really notice how much lifting it's doing it holds a lot of stuff together cohesively and coherently and it does this without ever really beating you over the head over the fact that it's trying to do a thing it's really well made it's really well acted it's really pretty to look at it's great And this is how it's going to help you write better because it is just a wealth of things to look at. You just have to be willing to look. On we go. So we've got five elements to talk about. The first is characters. I'm big on characters, so we're going to get big on character here. We define a character. So you're going to define your character by the combination of traits you're going to change as well as the traits that aren't going to change, but that you're going to reinforce. Because when we have a character, whether it's a detective in a detective story, whether it's a love interest in a romance novel, whether it's the the knight in a fantasy story, whether it's just a regular person in some literary fiction, they have some element about them that they're going to change or resolve or transform or do something with. It could be, you know, I got to go throw a ring in a volcano, or it could be, I want to learn how to love again, or I have to stop the killer or something, anything. But that pile of traits, that conflict, that problem, that thing, whatever it is, is not the sum total of their existence. It's just the thing they're going to change. Think about regular people for a minute. You know, nobody is only there, you know, smoking. If they want to quit smoking, 
that's not the sum total of them. And I understand that, yes, with vegans, for instance, people do make veganism the like the, the sum of their existence. And that's sort of blown out for hyperbole and humor. But by and large, people are a mix of traits to change, things they want to work on, but also traits that get reinforced, traits that are very much them no matter what. And you, when you're creating your character, whether this is a main character, and we're going to talk mostly main characters for this, but you can do this with secondary characters too, the sidekicks, the love interests, the people in the orbit of the main character, they have traits that won't necessarily change, but will get kind of firmed up and repeated and reinforced just by being in the story. You know, your your really nice best friend character is going to stay the really nice best friend, assuming the story isn't about losing that friendship. Those traits reinforce and they stay that way. They don't double down. Don't look at the word reinforce and think amplify because it doesn't necessarily do that. The best friend doesn't get extra best. It's just that they stay that while shedding or transforming or affecting or changing this other portion of them, whether that's one skill or meeting one need or doing one task or changing in some way. And we define our character by the combination of stuff that changes versus stuff that doesn't change. And really where this kind of tips the apple cart of writing advice over is that a lot of people will tell you to make the character element you want to change a big deal. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not bad advice, but it's ineffective because you can't only look at a character's changes to see the whole character. For instance, here is Cassian Andor. He's our protagonist. He's our main guy. We're going to follow him no matter what. We're going to introduce other characters along the way when we, we have breaks in the story or when we need to fill in the gaps around other things. But by and large, Cassian Andor is Cassian Andor. And we can define him initially, his set of traits to change, are he's incredibly selfish, not malevolent. He's not malicious. He's not miserly. He's not, you know, snotty or rude about it. He's just out for himself. And that often puts him into conflict with the people around him. And it reduces their expectations of him because they just assume he's looking out for himself. And over the course of the story, that's going to change through a number of different factors and a number of different arcs and a number of different times, that's our trait that's going to change. However, the elements that will be, you know, reinforcing the elements that we're going to stick with things like courage, uh, an ability to defy authority, question authority, challenge a bad or dumb rule, encourage other people. He's an, Cassian Andor as a character is an incredible motivator. That doesn't mean he's completely inert or lacking agency. It's just that one of his primary skills is to, uh, you know, sort of develop other people. His job is to lift them up, boost them, empower them, which also in turn empowers himself. So think of your character, no matter the genre, no matter who it is, your, every character, some more so than others, but every character is a combination of things. If you're, Thinking about, well, who or what is my character? Look for the combination rather than just the identifiable. My character is a really good cook or my character is an accountant because that's, that's like saying you're just your day job or I'm just, you know, one person in a tax bracket or something. Don't limit it. Look for places where we overlap multiple Venn diagrams, if that makes sense. On we go. No matter what skill we change, no matter what conflict we deal with, a character's nature doesn't change. A person is how a person is. They're fundamentally good. They're fundamentally bad. They're, they're you know, talented. They're kind. They're caring. They're attractive. They're insatiable. They're lustful. They're passionate, they're quiet, they're shy, they're reserved. Those traits, those identifying labels, they're a rebel. They're a rule follower. They're a fascist thug. They're, you know, 
we, we take them as shorthand and we use them as sort of like big post-it notes to kind of tack on to somebody like a big neon sign. Those things don't change. Not without a massive like effort and redemption arc. The reason why Darth Vader changes is because he yeets an old man down a space hole. Not everybody's got an old man to yeet down a space hole. And if everybody gets a redemption arc, it kind of gets boring real quick because it's just a matter of, well, where is everybody in their arc? And we're just waiting for everybody to finish. Nature doesn't change, though. Not in storytelling structures. What changes is how a character approaches their nature. Cassian Andor is fundamentally a good guy. He's a little selfish. He's a little, you know, self-absorbed might be a better way of saying it. And he's a little abrasive in the presence of authority or discipline. He's looking out for himself and he wants to do the, the greatest collective good for himself and the people he cares about. That stuff doesn't change. The other problems though, that changes, but his nature, the essence of him, if you take your character and you distill them down and say, my character is, and the first set of thoughts that come to your head beyond just their superficial descriptors, my character is male identifying and, and, and five foot eight and a professional alligator wrestler. Those are fairly superficial things because height and, and identity are important, but they're not the soul of everything. And being an alligator wrestler is a, a thing you do. It's sort of like putting on shoes. It's just a task. Find their nature. How do they... How do they feel and identify beyond their identifier labels? Find their nature and then figure out how they approach that nature. How does that nature come out in the world? A character who is abrasive to authority might act in aggression or transgression to some rules. They're a punk snot kid who doesn't follow the rules, who often gets into trouble. That nature of standing up to authority or poking, you know, poking their nose at it or, or, or something like that, that doesn't change. But how they exist, how they do that, that's going to change because you can't always be 14 and throwing rocks in abandoned building windows. At some point, you're going to be 22 and in a job and just out of college or, or 42 and waking up one day and realizing what are you supposed to do with your life? Nature doesn't change, but the approach does. Now, we talked a lot about Andor. Here, for instance, is Cyril Karn. That's the guy. And his mom, who's a mom. Uh, Cyril Karn is, a, is, to put this mildly, a fascist fuckboy. He's, he's exactly the sort of guy who thinks that because of what he identifies as, a dude with a little bit of authority, a dude in, in a kind of position of power and a kind of a position of privilege that he is entitled to just by dint of existence, entitled to a certain level of success, entitled to a certain kind of existence, entitled to a certain way things have to be for him. And adversity is somebody else's stuff. He's him and he's doing the right thing because every character believes they're doing the right thing fundamentally. And, and that steers his path. So when his whole story gets upended because all of a sudden reality meets his bubble of privilege and, and assumption, he ends up back at home with mommy making him cereal with Star Wars infamous blue milk. He's a secondary character. Secondary characters, they get their own arcs. But, and this is important, those arcs serve theme and the big picture, Cyril Karn's actions and his pursuit of justice are what kick this story off. In short, to summarize some, some plot material for Andor, he's looking for his sister. In the course of looking for his sister, he is harassed by two essentially rent-a-cops. And, you know, because, you know, 13, 12, all cops are bastards. We get into a fight with these rent-a-cops, and they end up dead. Yay! Cops are dead. Cassian's on the run. Cyril Karn, a cop at the time, realizes that something is afoot, and nobody seems to be taking it as seriously as he's taking it. So he kicks off a whole process to, you know, make Cassian Andor essentially a very wanted person. 
due to some other issues and elements in the course of trying to do what Cyril says is the right thing, you know, he ends up losing his job. Boo who the white guy doesn't get what he wants. Boo who his arc to sort of come to terms or fail to come to terms with this and evolve in some kind of gross, disaffected, disenfranchised white guy who should probably, you know, learn about stoicism and produce an ebook. Um, his effort to do that and then make some kind of dude bro podcast, uh, leads his arc to serve the theme more than the plot. And it serves the greater star Wars story because it helps kick Cassian towards the rebellion with a capital R so that, you know, we can go forward with the rest of the star Wars saga. So Cyril's important, but Cyril is not important as Cyril thinks Cyril is, but a secondary character arc serves theme. In this case, Cyril's arc serves the theme that those in power are inherently willing to be aggressive to preserve a status quo. And everybody else needs to just get out of their way. And when that doesn't happen, tension and conflict happen. The main character and their arc and the main character's actions are going to be more specific than that. So your secondary character is doing shit in the story. They're going to aim for theme. So it helps to know your themes. No matter what you're writing, no matter what your genre is, if you're about to tell me, hey, John, I don't think I have a theme, go find one. Make sure you do, because I guarantee you do. You just really haven't thought about it. But secondary characters, and then this also extends out and ripples out for tertiary characters. Mom here, Blue Milk Lady, tertiary character. She's there for levity. She's there to kind of break up things and give Cyril somebody to bounce off of, because it would be differently awful to have him just eating cereal by himself. The, the point is tertiary characters further serve theme. The, the more distant you get from main characters, the less you are resolving plot conflict and the more you are handling supporting stuff, theme, world building, power dynamics, status quo structure, stuff like that. What you need to keep in mind is that if you know where you want to go, I know by the end of the story, my character, my main character is going to go in this way and do this thing. They're going to say this. They're going to feel that. They're going to end up in this position. They're going to have this or they're going to lose that or whatever. If you know the destination, but not really the road to get there, there are going to be some roads that get there directly, the express lane. Oh, I just have to have the main character to do one, two, three things and boom, bang, we're done and other roads that are going to be more leisurely, let's say, for lack of a better word. Other steps where it's instead of, you know, one, two, three things, get the main plot done, it's going to be, you know, a 12-step process because we also have subplots and detours. One is not better than the other. They're just different. Because you could tell the Cassian Andor becomes a rebel story without Cyril. You could just have him get recruited by Stellan Skarsgård and have him, you know, deal with the Empire and he could get wanted for a number of little things along the way. You don't specifically need Cyril. You don't specifically need the sister. It helps because that sort of gives us some sort of additional access to the character. But those are more direct roads shortens the season. It reduces our amount of writing specifically, and it gives us a chance to focus just on the point we're trying to make. When you end up taking too direct a road too quickly, your story feels very clipped and it feels very underdeveloped. That's because functionally you haven't developed it a lot. Whereas if you go the other way and, oh, by the way, there's this detour in these guys and over here, and he's got to go here and he's got to go this way and that way and this, that, and the other thing. And we start extending everything the story feels much slower because we're moving at a slower pace. And while we are doing a greater quantity of things, we're not necessarily doing things that help us get where we're going. We're just busy taking up time and space. Know which roads are which. And you can do that by sitting down and thinking through the story. Okay, I have this character. I know at the end they're going to, you know, in a romance novel, maybe they're going to get a happily ever after ending. Okay, cool. 
the character's problem is that they are very, very selfish. Okay, so I know the conflict of the story has to be them learning to be less selfish. Okay, to direct a road and that selfishness doesn't feel developed enough and the, the resolution seems too quick. Too long a road and it seems like the problem isn't a very big problem. You got to find that sweet spot relative to how you're shaping and framing the story. Learn your roads. On we go. Now, Star Wars is interesting because plot is not one of the primary points of our story triangle. Story triangle, if you're new, is character, world, and plot. Star Wars prioritizes character and world. And or particularly prizes character and world. Why is that? And that's because we know where this has to go. Andor is a book on a shelf where the other books are already in place. We know we have to get to Rogue One. And we know from Rogue One we have to get to Star Wars. There's not a lot of wiggle room when we look at a view like that. There just isn't, because we know where this ends up. We know Cassian dies at the end of Rogue One. Spoilers for a movie that you should, A, have seen, and B, it's been out like a decade. We know Rogue One, and we know Rogue One immediately feeds into Star Wars and the movie trilogy. So we know where this is going. We're not going to suddenly change everything because that invalidates all the other books on our metaphoric shelf. World building here seems like a limitation because we only seem then that we're penning ourselves in. And I think that's where the criticism for Andor first comes from. It's not very exciting. We don't have the stuff we get with the later movies or the cartoon spinoffs or anything like that, where the story is a bit more expansive and open-ended because we're, we're dealing with a very niche section. And yeah, from, from that perspective, sure. This is a, you know, comparing it to the laser swords and space wizards and space biplanes. This is a different kind of story. But that's all right. Because if we were to drill down on these specific, not space wizard, not laser sword elements, we really find that this section, this idea, this concept of the rebellion and what it means to be a rebel and what the empire looks like and how the empire just is day to day when we're not only dealing with, you know, space wizards and laser swords and all that stuff. The day to day stuff is completely untouched because we so often think about, think about it as disposable as, Oh, whatever. They're just rebels. Yeah. But there's like two Jedi, three Jedi in the whole fucking story. And everybody else is just a regular person. So now we get to fr we get to sort of frame our story and front our story around those regular people. Because most stories have two destinations. By the way, this is the ending moment in Rogue One. There's a plot resolution. We have to have the plot done. And a future trajectory that may or may not be explored. It's the idea that if we stopped reading here, and there were, or it doesn't really matter if there's a book two coming or there's no book two coming. It's the idea that from this point, now that we've resolved the plot, in theory, if there were stories, it would head in this direction. Our detectives solved one case, and there's the idea that they go back to work the next day, and who knows what's going to come through the door, and we leave the door open maybe if we're writing a series. But by and large, we have two destinations here. You're always going to have two, even if you never really follow through with one of them. You're, you're going to resolve your plot. You have to. That's the point. But the other stuff doesn't need to get touched. So for Rogue One and Andor as a result, we have two destinations. We know Andor has to feed to Rogue One. That's our future trajectory. So in the course of Andor, we still have a plot to resolve. Think about your destination or destinations and make sure you are always heading in that direction, even if you're not taking the express lane. If you've got a character who's trying to confront a personal issue and then they undergo some kind of great challenge or sacrifice in order to gain their happy ending, make it matter. 
It doesn't need to constantly be in every waking thought, in every waking minute, but it does need to be present. And the world of the story is that effort. You know, the planet, this is this takes place on Scarif. Scarif is a planet that exists primarily for Rogue One and then tangentially in the role-playing game. And, and past that and beyond that, um, we didn't know anything about it before. It was just sort of like, well, somebody took some plans and, and that's it. And then we made a, a billion dollars trying to fill in all the gaps. Know your destinations. Rather than try and hyper-architect and over-engineer all the steps, just know where you're going and make sure the story is within that, you know, path. The trajectory for your future trajectory, it's always going to be rooted in theme. Always, 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 always. Because that way you have the most utility for plot. If you've got a detective story series, case to case totally varies. But the detective is always the detective. Sure, they're gaining and losing things along the way, but the detective is always the detective. The detective because fundamentally the detective is there to do the, you know, to carry forward the theme. If we're looking at hard boiled fiction, it's, you know, the fallen paladin, the knight errant, the wandering hero who goes off and helps the people that no one else is helping. You take your trajectory. This is particularly true if you're a series writer and you want to root it in theme, not plot. Are you hearing me? big, giant, complicated fantasy series authors. You guys love to root your stuff in plot. Well, there's this wizard and a curse and a prophecy and 5,000 years of, of penguins and doodads and, you know, no one has peanut butter and, and whatever the hell else. If you root your trajectory in plot, you are essentially putting up boundaries you will run into. But if you root your trajectory in theme... It doesn't matter where your story goes, whether you bring in the guy from the bear and girls, or you go to Mon Mothma, or you go hang out with some fascists at a bureaucracy. You can root your story in theme. Star Wars, no matter what you want about the space wizards or some puppets or the fact that a certain movie should have been a certain way and this character should have been that way, which are all... Arguments not rooted in Star Wars, they're rooted in other shit. You gotta remember that Star Wars is about people, that it's an expression of, you know, people up against an empire. It's the little guy against the big guy. Star Wars is about people. That's a theme. People are able, not just because of magic space wizard powers, but people are able to come together and accomplish a thing and change their world. That's a theme. Our trajectory for Star Wars is always that. Space wizards are not the be-all, end-all. They're just a set of tools to do this. That's a really, really important distinction. Because Andor doesn't have space wizards. Rogue One mentions them, but doesn't have them. And when you take away the space wizard, whose magic powers can reduce the story's conflict or immediately suck all the air out of the room so that you're forced to pay attention to it. You lose sight of this theme. Don't lose sight of your theme. That's why it's important to know what your theme is so you can make sure that it's, it's present, not necessarily in every sentence overwritten into everything, but just that when it's present, it's clear. On we go. Because when you screw around with that, when, when you decide, ah, no, nah, trajectory isn't about theme, fuck theme. Theme can go out the window. When you deviate from theme and you forget the why at the heart of the story and you just make it about nostalgia or humor 
or that would be cool if, or, you know, we try to force an ending or force a thing or make it a certain way or appease the whiny people on the internet who complained that the story changed too much and they're uncomfortable recognizing maturity and maturity and growth because that doesn't seem very Star Warsy. That seems like that shit my ex-girlfriend used to say, and I can't have that in the fun thing I'm supposed to watch on the internet. Whenever you do any shit like that, whenever you have or entertain that kind of air quote debate, you end up with this where a perfectly good character who doesn't need to have a last name, who doesn't need to be, you know, affiliated with a last name or give up one last name to acquire another. You end up with, I'm Ray Skywalker. She doesn't need to be because the whole point is Star Wars is about people, not families. If we want to talk about movies with families, that's Fast and Furious. And it's not last names. Loads of other stories deal with my last name and therefore the burden I have to carry because of it. This is supposed to be about people, not the space wizards, not the space wizard powers, just people doing a thing to change the status quo for the better. It's a hopeful story. That's it. When, when you forget that, or when you put that to the side so that you can go tick some boxes on some kind of checklist, you end up with this. You end up with Ray Skywalker. Don't do that. You're better than that. Do better. On we go. Which leads us to the arcs because it's Andor's arc construction and plot construction that gives us the most crunchy stuff that we can talk about. Here's where we roll up our sleeves. Here's where we put on our work bathrobes and get to it. You can take Andor and divide it into pieces. There are 12 episodes. You can divide it like this. Episodes one to three are an introduction, lays the groundwork, tells us about just about everybody we need to know. Not everybody, but a lot of people we need to know and sort of the vibe of what's going on. It sets the table. Four through Episodes four through six are the first major set piece in Andor, a heist, a bank robbery. And it's three episodes, an episode of setup, uh, an episode of, of introduction, an episode of setup, and an episode of execution. Big action beat, big climax, big deal. Episode seven stands alone because it is a response to episode six. And episode seven is where the plot not the character arc, not the theme, the plot turns. Because of episodes four, five, and six, episode seven has stuff happen. And because of the events that happen in seven, we get into episodes eight, nine, and 10, which are a prison arc for not the, not the crime Cassian commits. He's just sort of caught up in another arrest. He's arrested while standing we have episodes eight, nine, and 10, a prison arc. Now in a prison story, just as a general structure, you tend to deal with themes of isolation, rebellion, repression, success, growth, loss, challenge, overcoming the system, surviving the system, dealing with a Kafka-esque bureaucracy. All that stuff's on the table for a prison arc. So we get eight, nine, and 10, a prison arc. Once we get out of 10, we move to the finale, which is episodes 11 and 12, which essentially function as part one and part two of a finale. So you can, I recommend, if you haven't watched the show and you're listening to this, I don't know what to tell you. Give it a shot. I think you'll really like it. But this construction, we're applying this to episodes, but there's no reason why this couldn't be applied to chapters as well. A couple chapters of introduction, a couple chapters where the story really kicks off, a, a chapter or several chapters where there are consequences and things take a twist and a turn, eight, nine, and 10, where things really build up to stuff. And maybe we have a different set of climaxes and then we have a resolution. This is not a single, this is not what's called monoclimactic. Monoclimactic is our typical idea for three act structure where we have a first act, a second act, it peaks at a climax, then it goes to resolution. Television has biclimactic, two climaxes, where you have sort of two 
smaller climaxes, if you were to add them up together, you'd get the same emotional height as a main climax. But you get two small rises and declines and move forward. Basic television five-act structure. That's a discussion for a different day for sure. But if we take this formula and this strategy of which chat, which episodes are which and which episodes help sort of move our nuts and bolts, we can break it down further so that episodes one through three introduce our character and tell us about our character start, starting point. But there's some overlap because some of that character starting point is also established in early in episode four. That's a bridge. It connects. So now instead of just going one to three, we're into four. Troy, it's so good to see you. Thank you for being here. Hello, chat. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I forgot to say hello to chat. Hello, chat. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming here. Thanks for being here. It means the world to me. So we've, we've built this little bridge to overlap one through three and then into four a little bit. And that's our character starting point. We've learned about the character. We've learned about the situation. We've learned about the stakes. We've developed it a little bit. It's what we're doing by making these bridges and stretching things across is that we are not creating hard divisions. We can't easily pin down and go, by the time we hit page, I'm going to make page numbers up, page 20, we're done learning everything. It's more fluid than that. Your writing, your story structure should be more fluid than that. There aren't specific pages that are supposed to be or specific chapters that are supposed to be. Yes, you came in late. The, I always put these things on YouTube. This whole thing will be on YouTube um, definitely tomorrow. I'll upload it overnight. It will definitely be up and available tomorrow, Troy. It'll also be on the podcast feed within like 10 minutes of me finishing. There are loads of ways you can totally get this thing. Back to, so the concept that we're stretching one, two, three, and a little bit of four is called bridging. Bridging is the idea that we're blurring those divisions and, and making the story feel more interconnected. And then we have four, five, and six, which carries the end of six, the, the consequences and everything deal with and bleed into more or less a third of episode seven. And then the rest of seven is fully consequences. It's the moment the plot takes a turn because of the events in one through six, we, we shift. There's a, there's a, there's what's called a plot schism that allows us to change and transform the story. And those are consequences for our character. They are both global consequences, but personal consequences, global consequences. They rob uh, a vault and some people die along the way. And we get to learn a little bit about our character who tra who's transformed not only by the action of robbing the bank, but his goal for robbing the bank. And he, and he learns from the people who, with whom he robs the bank. Our character has seen a transformation, wants to change, wants to be different. He doesn't vocalize this and verbalize this. He doesn't say, I want to change and be a better person because nobody talks like that. that. That's weird. But he begins to transform in the course of four, five, and six and into seven. And in the rest of seven and into the beginning of episode eight, he deals with the consequences of that transformation. This is a normal part of a character arc. Character wants to change. It's not easy. The effort to change causes tension, static drama, conflict within the status quo he used to have. Here is a, here is a not personal example. Let's suppose you wanted to, I don't know, Get into shape and go to therapy because you wanted to be a better version of you. And in doing that, the people around you who were used to you not being that way bristle a little at the idea of you changing because it's forcing themselves to look at, you know, who they are and why they're not changing. And then in the course of you going to therapy, maybe you learn about setting effective boundaries so that you change how you relate to these people. And in the course of that, maybe you lose some people along the way consequences. Not, you know, it's not always going to be, oh my God, the monster is attacking me from underneath the bed. Sometimes it's just, I lose my status quo. I end up in a new circumstance and in a new set of situations, which is what happens in episodes eight, nine, and 10 when Cassian goes to prison, where unlike all these other th 
episodes up to this point where he's been able to, to some degree, avoid direct consequence, where he's just been uh, a semi-anonymous face in the crowd, even though he's been wanted and pursued. He, he's just, he's able to have a life. He's able to just kind of go through his days. And yeah, he can k- kind of keep his head underwater or head out of trouble or whatever metaphor you want to use. But here in prison, he's, he's a known factor and prison stuff. So he faces conflict as a result, and he makes changes. Now, the, the cascading effect of those changes he makes not only resolve the prison arc, but also finish and complete his transformation. You can't get to 8, 9, 10, and part of 11 without going through 7, and you can't get 7 to stick without dealing with 4, 5, and 6, and you can't get to 4, 5, and 6 without dealing with 3, and you can't get to 3 without going through 1 and 2. We've created a sense of interdependence where everything hinges on each other without necessarily being very clear-cut. We're overlapping a lot of these pieces. So that when we get to 11 and 12, we see the full effect of all the changes, all the growth, all the transformation made from episodes essentially 1 through 10. Although if we're trying to narrow down the exact amount of transformation, it's the, the end of 3 through 10, the end of 10 completes our transformation and 11 and 12 is our payoff, our demonstration of that change. That structure, bridging, blending things together, pulling things apart, being able to identify a starting point, a want to transformation, uh, wants to transform, a beginning of that transformation, conflict along the way, completing the transformation. That's just character arc building. That's how that goes. That's that's just what that is. Andor does it in a sort of a, not an abridged style but in an interconnected style. You're not really skimping on anything. Yes, you don't learn the nuts and bolts of everything. There are time jumps, but they're done in service of telling the story because what's being jumped is monotony. There are time jumps in the prison arc because we don't need to see every day to understand that every day is a grind. On we go. Which takes us to plot. Now, there's a difference between a global plot, which we would also call a series plot, and a specific stories plot. And the whole of one, the whole of the the specific stories plot, should fit inside the global series plot. So let's back up and take a look at this chart one more time. The individual episode plot, the plot of episode one, the plot of episode two, the plot of episode three, fit within the container of one, two, or three, or whatever chapter we're talking about. Your episode plot is a thing in itself. That plot also fits in the section. So the plot within episode three is within all of three, but it helps wrap up the plot of episodes one to three. And the the chunk of one to three is also part of the greater one to 12. What this means for you and your book is that the events of these scenes, the events of these chapters take place within a chapter but they're also part of the the first act, the second act, the climax, the third act. And it's not that we're drilling down and narrowing down and saying chapter 20 must be a climax. Chapter 15 has to be this. It doesn't need to be that. It doesn't work like that. It's not going to suddenly spontaneously start being that. The point is that you can't tell the overall total story just by cramming everything in one installment. You can't, have a chapter that does all the world building. You can't have a chapter that is all the critical climax stuff. You can't have a chapter that is all the talking this one character is going to do. That's ridiculous and unwieldy. You've got to understand that the big, every time we zoom out one level, all those smaller components fit together. 
So if we look at episode one and walk through its beats, they work within one. But when we zoom out and just look at the introduction set of episodes one to three, those individual beats are smaller. But they're still reflective of elements, not just specific elements that will come back in the finale because, oh, hey, it's that same guy again. But that relationship and that dynamic and that idea comes back. This is the whole point of organizing your construction. You don't just want to have, you know, oh, I'm, I'm bringing this guy back for reference. No, have the spaceship parking lot guy come back, not just because, oh, he has dogs. And every time the dogs bark, it's because Cassian is around. It's you need that guy because that guy represents something more than he's a spaceship parking lot attendant. He's a critical guy who's going to help tow a droid away after the droid, after the riot, after the this, after the that. It makes the pieces matter because they do more, because they fit more into a greater composition. That's why we care about plotting. Your overall big series plot, right, is to, at least for the uh, season one of Andor, is, hey, all that stuff he was building in prison is part of the Death Star. He's building the machine that he will later steal the plans of. He is building the machine that will later kill him. He is building the machine that, you know, a space farm boy will blow up in his space biplane thanks to space magic. Everything fits together in some way, but not in these big, giant, flowing, overwritten, big elements. It's a thousand million billion little pieces that you get to organize and orient. The point of this, the whole structure for the story that kind of gets lost along the way, at least for Andor, is that the galaxy is made of people. And under fascism, existence and survival can be revolutionary acts. That's the message Andor, no matter what, doesn't want to stray from. That's the thing Andor orients by. So whether we're talking about you know, seeing it from Cassian and the rebels here before the bank heist, or whether we're seeing it with Mon Mothma and the sort of political elite, or whether we're seeing it from, you know, um, Aunt Petunia from Harry Potter, who's uh, Cassian's sort of adoptive kidnappy mom. No matter what dimension or facet we see it from, we never stray from this message. In your work, Find your message. Get it into a sentence, ideally. Two sentences, sure, I guess. One is better. Aim for one. And if that means you got to drill down and stop bringing up like, oh, there's a dragon. What's the point of the dragon? What's the point of learning the this and the doing of the that and then chucking the ring in the volcano? What's the point? Get to the point, not because you need to be brief about it, but because we need to be clear about it. Because everything is going to come down to this point. And no matter what story element we pick up, we can find some dimension of the point in it. We go follow Cyril as he becomes weird, creepy stalker guy with uh, one of the evil imperial women. It's because that element describes life under fascism and what it's like to be disappointed by your station in life and what it feels like to sort of have to transgress and carve against and push back against the system. Survival can be a revolutionary act. That sentence you find for your story can be tweaked and redefined and recontextualized per character or per event, but there's always going to be a sentence and you need to find it. On we go. You need to remember that small parts contribute a percentage of the greater whole. If we were to add all these pieces together, he, you know, escapes at the end of three, he meets up with some people, they impersonate some, uh, some Imperials to get into the vault to rob it. Uh, he ends up going to prison for a completely different thing. And oh, by the way, his mom dies and becomes a force ghost. Well, at least a recording because one of the elements in Star Wars is that there's always a ghost of the past speaking to those currently living or in the present to influence their actions, because actions are not 
produced in a bubble or a vacuum. It's all these steps that add up to total Andor. You can't just take one of them and say, ah, that's Andor. It's one plus one plus one plus one plus one, however many times. I'm going to get a mouthful of water. I'm going to plug this in because it's beeping at me. And, and then we'll continue. The point I want to bring up when I'm back, hang on a second. The point I want to bring up is that there's a very famous story um, about the nature of things. A guy gets a BMW. I don't know why it's always a guy, and I don't know why it's always a BMW. But in this story, a guy gets a BMW, and he, he loves the car, loves every part of it, and he, he's meticulous in how he cares for it, replaces all the belts and all the spark plugs and does all the car things like a lot. To the point where he disassembles the whole car and cleans and ma maintains every single part, every nut, every bolt, every washer, every facet, whatever. At what point does he find the BMW-ness of the car? Is it in that one screw right there or is it in the spark plug or is it in that wire or is it in that tube or is it in the whole engine block or is it in the windshield or is it in the, the fuse or... It's never just one thing. It's always a ton of a little a ton of little things working together, adding up to get the end result. Too often, you find writers who are trying to have these big ingenious stories that are focused and centered around like one or two big things. Ah, oh, I have a, a character who's who's immortal and he falls in love with a regular person or you know, here's a fish monster who learns to speak English or play the bagpipes. Or I have a, a character who falls in love and finds true hope in the world. And they end up trying to pin that idea on one key element and make it sort of the tent pole, and then everything else is sort of subordinate. And it never works because you want to look at smaller pieces adding together. And then make each piece the best it can be so that even though some pieces compared to each other, you know, the prison uh, trilogy of, of episodes is different than the introductory episodes, but they're both, you know, they both have action beats. They both have character development beats, but they're different in weight and load because they're just different things. Don't force it. Just organize it. And then remember even further that when we're talking about plot and construction, whether we're talking about, you know, here are the chapters in this book, that that book is part of a series. This is particularly true if you're writing a series. If you're not writing a series, understand that your elements within your single book are representative of some greater whole contributing to your genre. So, all those little scenes equal and add up to Andor, but Andor is part of the whole group to take us to Rogue One and then take us into Star Wars. And we can't get to episode eight, you know, with the, the later sequel trilogy without walking through Andor. That doesn't put extra weight on Andor. That's what the internet will tell you it does. It just means that what Andor has to do is just take us forward. The lesson for us for writing here is that it can feel like if I don't get chapter one right, I've screwed up chapter 10. That's the fear. You deal with, you know, you'll see a lot of writers. You maybe are one of those writers who listens to a thing or reads a thing and then says to themselves, God, I, I have to make this work because so much is counting on it. If I can't say a thing now on page 10, you know, the whole thing's a waste, which is a grotesque amount of pressure to put on yourself. And there's no reason to do that. You, you just don't need to. There's, you, you just don't. Just slot your pieces together. Little piece, little piece, little piece, little piece. All together makes a thing. And then that book fits somewhere in the world. Small steps, small goals, small construction, each individually made to the best of your ability at the time. And that's more than enough you can do. On we go.
Which leads us to sort of that fifth element, the last kind of thing to talk about today, which are expectations. Because oof, expectations in Star Wars are a mess. Star Wars, I don't know if you know this, has some of the worst fandom communities imaginable. They are racist. They are sexist. They are bullies. They are disgusting. They are loud. They are angry. They are disenfranchised. They are privileged. They are self-absorbed. They are overly critical, overly literal, cranky, a num- discompassionate, a number of things. And that there is no way to make them happy. You do a thing and then some group is going to complain about it. And at the same time, another group is going to praise it and then say, well, why didn't you do more of that? There's no making them happy. There is no satisfying them. And that's because those groups are driven by their emotional response to previous elements. The reason why everybody got really upset about Luke being older is because they had an expectation about how Luke should have been relative to material that went before, as well as their own expectation, their own fear, their own insecurity, the fact that they didn't want a story that way. They wanted this other thing. They wanted the new thing to feel like the old thing. And when it can't possibly do that because that's not how time works, they get angry. Your fan base, your readership, whether that's just the five people who buy your book, or the 50 people who buy book one and the 500 people who buy book three, they're going to have many varied opinions. You will see many different reviews, many different comments, lots of different feedback at all different stages in the process. Some people will give you one star and tell you they liked the book just fine. Other people will give you five stars and tell you 25 things they didn't like. Your job in your writing, whatever you're writing, Your job is to not make them happy. You don't have to make them happy. Your job isn't to try and make them happy. Your job isn't to try and guess what it is that will satisfy them or guess what you could possibly write like you're on a game show and try to win a prize. Your job is to produce the best thing you can and or does not try and make everybody happy and or does not try to satisfy anybody, nor does it go the other way and intentionally try to piss everybody else off. You know, there is something to be said for that strategy of like, well, screw it. If I can't, you know, make anybody happy, I'm not going to make, you know, if I can't please these five people, fuck everybody. Don't do that either. There's no reason to get, you know, angry over your insecurity. You can't make everybody happy. It's not your job to make everybody happy. Don't try and force that. Just produce the best work you can. Because what Andor does well are these things. It has a strong character arc. You get to learn about Cassie and Andor and how a rebel becomes a rebel and how radicalization works and how empowerment works and the power of change and transformation. It does that while staying within the bounds of Star Wars. It does that without gimmick. It does that without, oh, we got to have another Jedi. Oh, we have to have, you know, another Jedi who survived the Jedi murder issue. Oh, we have to have a special, you know, doodad thingamajig. It does that by remaining true to that premise of Star Wars is about people. It builds a relatable arc. A guy who acts and behaves a certain way, transforms over time thanks to changes and decision he makes. That plot is based on a relatable character arc. The story isn't just, you know, 13 or sorry, 12 different episodes with 12 different thing hap with 12 different bad guys and 12 different solutions like a Saturday morning cartoon used to be. The story is divided into sections. We have the introduction, we have the Aldani heist, we have the the, you know, the consequences of the Aldani heist, the prison arc and the resolution. And then within those sections, there's subdivisions. There's three episodes for this three episodes for that, one single standalone, three episodes, and then two episodes in the finale. And overall, all of these things get tied together through the lens of aesthetics. There are, there's an amazing soundtrack, amazing soundtrack that is, 
you know, evocative and emotional, but also very different from sort of the other bombastic John Williams stuff, for instance. There's also a real lack of artificiality. These things were shot practically. The, you know, those, those places are real places. The sets are real sets. The costumes feel worn and dirty because it's not this overly sterile, polished thing made in a computer. It's a real place and it's real people with real things because, again, it's staying true to that singular vision of this is our theme and this is our core message. And when you stick to that as much as possible without trying to get extra fancy, without trying to get extra showy offy, is that a thing I could say? Without trying to do it that way, your writing improves as a result. You don't try and solve problems by making extra complicated new shit. Oh, I'll just make a wizard spell for that. Oh, I'll just add in a MacGuffin. Rather than trying to bring in something external to solve a problem, you solve a problem within the logic and structure of what you already have. That's what Andor does really, really well. It tells a contained story relatably wrapped tightly around theme. And at no point does it reach for easy, lazy, comfortable answers. It's worth your time. It's worth taking a look at, even if you're not writing sci-fi, even if you hate star Wars, even if you think the whole star Wars fandom debate is gross and, or is worth your time as a set of writing tools. Are there, any questions from anybody in chat? Otherwise, we'll get out of here. All right, let's get out of here. Thank you so much for checking this out. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thanks for letting me talk about a thing I absolutely love and adore. Uh, remember, if you're on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash John helps you write better. Tomorrow is Oppenheimer Day. And uh, if you are just, a, just any, a patron at any level, you can get a full three plus hour breakdown of Oppenheimer tomorrow. But if you're a member of any of the higher tiers, there will also be a second breakdown. So... Consider checking that out, patreon.com forward slash John helps you write better. Thanks for being here. I hope you're doing well. I will see you tomorrow for not only stuff on Patreon, but also the writer's chat right here at twitch.tv forward slash John helps you write better. Have a great night.